welcome to our town, and I'm Carol Nickett. And we've talked about many, many aspects of St. Petersburg and how a town, a city, gets its identity. But one of the things we haven't talked about is the way the environment and the earth and the things that grow and the way we keep our city in terms of ecology, recycling, and so on, and how that helps to shape who we are, not only as the physical aspects, but also how culturally we present ourselves, and how in terms of social justice we present ourselves, and how we um, exist here in our city. So this Our Town is going to discuss that, and our guest, and I hope we can welcome him, is Dr. Kent Curtis, who we always call Kip Curtis. So please welcome Kip Curtis. So um, as a, those of you who are veterans to our town know, my first question is always, how did you come to St. Petersburg? Well, um, by airplane. Uh, <laughs> I, Actually, St. Petersburg is sort of a little part of my family history. I did not come, but my great-grandmother uh, had a place down at Pinellas Point, and my mother came as a child, and so as a child, I heard all about St. Petersburg from my mother, having never visited. Uh, I actually arrived physically myself for the very first time in 2006. Uh, I was recruited and hired by Eckerd College to work as their lone environmental humanities professor in the Environmental Studies program. And. Um an environmental studies program, um, when I went to college, there was no such thing. Uh, I think when I was in graduate student, a student, there was no such thing. So how did that come about that universities and colleges are now having that as actually a discipline? Right, yeah, well, it's a very good question. I, um, there was no environmental studies when I was in college either. It's something that started to appear in colleges and universities in the 70s in response to the environmental crisis itself. And it was an effort what by... What do you mean environmental crisis? Well, environmental crisis. so I remember the 1970s. Um, and in fact, anybody who does um, will be amazed that we're alive today because the, in the 70s, the crisis was sort of the, the, the problem du jour, right? We are running out of resources, we're running out of forests, we're losing biodiversity. Um, in, in many ways, some overstatements, in many ways, some statements about things that continue to trouble us uh, and be a problem for us. So in, in the midst of that, scholars, biologists, political scientists, um, literature professors, all sort of coming together and saying, well, one of the points of education is to help us build the society of the future. It's sort of remaking our society um, for the next generation, as it were. And this became a topic. Um, and in the early 70s, places like Oberlin, UC Santa Barbara, started to have these ecology programs, um, gradually becoming environmental studies programs. And by the 90s, they took off. Um, and now, there is barely a university or college out there that doesn't have environmental studies, which does that same thing, kind of bring together your political, your, your social sciences, your sciences, and your humanities to, uh, as best we can, address this issue of human habitat on the globe. So, when you were an undergraduate, where were you? I was in New York City. I went to the New School for Social Research. And what was your major? Uh, liberal studies. I mean, I, I read history, I read literature. It was a, it was a genuine liberal arts experience, uh, and so a broadly trained. And then you went to graduate school to do. I did. I spent a number of years. So I spent about six years. You know, you graduate college and you're all grown up, but you're not. Um, and I spent about six years kind of figuring out what I wanted to do. I discovered um, an author uh, and historian named Donald Worcester, who uh, was just this marvelous, if you ever encountered his work, just this marvelous historical writer, um, and decided that was what I wanted to do, that I wanted to pursue. And what sort of history did he write about? Well, his original history was a history of the ecology movement, um, yeah. and where he talked about its origins in romanticism and its origins in the modernization of science and the different trends, um, in part to warn the environmental movement of the 70s that there were a lot of different groups, that it, there wasn't a simple answer 
um, in this in this movement, which was let's just love nature. But that in fact, there were a lot of voices at play. So it was this the sort of popular movement that then had become a part of scholarship um, and a part of a sort of rigorous history. And then he was a great writer. So I that that became the pursuit. That became so I during the six years. You must have done something else than just reading his things. books. Yeah, I, so I, my first job out of college, in 1988 I graduated, which dates me, you can do the math. Um, 1988 was the hottest summer on record. Um, at the same time, 1988 was the year that they began to show pictures of the ozone hole. Um, and so New York City, where I was living at the time, was unbearably hot. If you've ever been in New York in the summer, it's worse than St. Pete. In the summer. It's, it's hot and humid. That's true. It's yeah, very miserable. And and so I had come out of the school that was very much about training citizens of the world, thinking about issues and problems and finding ways to engage yourself as a citizen. And the environment really kind of struck me as, well, this is what I want to do. In fact, I wanted to be a journalist. And I got hired by Interview Magazine. Uh -huh. And I spent about six weeks coming home from work and drinking myself to sleep. I was miserable. It was back. <laughs> there was beautiful people. It was Andy Warhol studio. Yeah. I mean, it, Interview Magazine then was like the thing. It was the thing. Although I got tired of fact-checking interviews with Michelle Pfeiffer, I felt like there was more. <laughs> that I could do with my life. And so I jumped ship. I took about a $15,000 a year cut in pay and went to work for the Natural Resources Defense Council, um, which and is- And what did they do? They do uh, scientific and legal policy. They, was that in New York or DC? That was in New York City. Hmm. Um, and then I did that for a couple of years and, um, and then moved over to work for Jeffrey Hollander as he kind of brought seventh generation, which is a, you see the paper, in the supermarkets now. Dish from detergent. Dish detergent. Yeah, yeah, so um, I worked for him we use it. for a couple of years as he okay. brought that into existence. Huh. And where was that? That was also New York City. Huh. And then and then I got tired of cities and moved And to why is seventh generation products better than I suspect the idea well, that they're better yeah. than regular? Right. They are, what they do is they source recycled material, they source material that isn't tra being transported a lot. So low, what do you call sustainable today? Um, low impact, um, lower uses of energy, lower uses of material. They were the first to come out with recycled um, paper towels. Um, they're big, and the thing that we did when I was there was green cotton, because cotton is just a horrible crop for the environment. Um, so they found organic cotton growers and then cotton producers who wouldn't bleach it, which took most of the toxics out of the product process itself. And they were the first purveyors of that. Why is well. cotton so bad? Because you need to use a lot of pesticides and herbicides to grow it. It's a very uh, energy intensive crop in the production. <laughs> and they bleach it. And, and bleach is great for the whites. It's horrible for the environment. <laughs> So um, you do all these things, and then what you decide you need to go to graduate school? I do. It actually, and it was this moment. I was a, I was a journalist in um, Missoula. I was working for a startup called Missoula Independent. I was writing uh, environmental stories and political stories. And one night, I picked a book off my girlfriend's shelf, Nature's Economy, Don Worcester's book, and I literally read it from cover to cover. It was one of those moments where a book changes your Say life. Say the name again? It's called Nature's Economy. Nature's Economy. Okay. And published by Cambridge University Press. And that was his doctoral dissertation. And I was, I, I kind of thought my career was going to be journalism, and I, I might even go into a, a master's in, I'm an MFA in journalism. And I said, no, this is it. This is, this is what I want to do, because it takes the sort of journalistic interest that I have even further. Um, it allows you to write a full scholarly study of the kinds of problems, kinds of issues, the framing of the world that we live in today. And, and then I did everything I could to get his attention and get him to accept me into his program. And where was that? Kansas. <laughs> in Lawrence. In Lawrence, Lawrence is a beautiful town. It's a beautiful town. When I, when, I I found him, when I found him as a scholar, he was actually working at Brandeis. So I thought I was applying to Boston. And then I did the research and I was like, Kansas. <laughs> and I imagined actually flat corn oh, for as yeah. far as the eye can see. But Lawrence is not like that. Lawrence, so, and it's near Kansas City, which is just a wonderful yeah, city. It's a beautiful so, part of Kansas Yes, it is. Absolutely. Huh. So, this is what's interesting. So, from what you've just heard, um, you would think that K 
Kip is this sort of scholar type, and his family was probably these, you know, scholar types and things like that. But so, um, <laughs> tell us about your parents and how you grew up. Oh, <laughs> well, um, I, I mean, my parents were, I think, fairly normal people in the late 60s yeah. and possibly even into the early 70s. We call them hippies. That's they, what we were. <laughs> but they, did, they got bitten by the back of the land movement. Um, and we were living on what was an investment property in southeastern Massachusetts. It was a 20-acre former chicken farm. It had been abandoned in the 50s when the egg industry got consolidated. Um, and it had been purchased to turn into real estate, essentially. It was a nice investment, 495 was going to come through there at some point. Um, and sometime around 72 or 73, I don't know where exactly they found it, but they decided that, that really the right thing to do was to create a sustainable farm and to have their children and themselves grow their own food, grow their own vegetables, and cut their own heat. Um, work in a co-op and trade um, as much as could to, to live it as low in the economy as possible. Now I get to milk a cow for eight years. <laughs> so, um, how many siblings did you have? I have five. There are six of us. Uh, two boys, four girls. Um, I'm the second oldest. And so you grew up working on a farm? That's why they could imagine a farm. In fact, they had the free labor. <laughs> yeah, really yes, so I grew up doing, doing raising, raising and eating my own hogs, um, raising and milking cows, um, cutting wood, chopping wood for the heat uh, and hot water of the house, uh, growing baked vegetables um, that we consume, canning, etc. All of the things that we were supposed to do to save ourselves from the impending fall of Western civilization, which if you remember the 1970s, right there. Oh, yeah. We shouldn't be here right now. Yeah. yeah. So are your parents still alive? They are. And they and just they the chicken farm? No, they turned it into real estate in the late 1980s and moved out of civilization to far northern Maine. They live up in Washington County, Maine. They have a 90 acre organic farm that they just huh. turned over to a neighbor to lease and it stopped farming themselves. Hmm. Um, and so, yeah, they've been farmers their whole lives. They, they took a very good But they didn't grow up being farmers. They did not, and they did not know how to farm when we started either. It was, it was a learning curve, for sure. <laughs> so, um, so, it's not a surprise then that, given that, that you were fascinated by. Um, issues of the environment and ecology and sustainability and social justice because that's really what your parents were about. They were addressing that. Um, mm -hmm. Although there was an interesting turn in that, in that I, and so, so when I tell people I grew up on a sustainable farm, there's always this kind of, oh, wasn't that nice. I hated it. <laughs> I hated every minute of it. And it created a, a almost an aversion to nature in me because nature meant labor. Nature were the trees that needed to be cut, the cow that needed to be mowed, the chickens that needed to, everything that and needed to be done. And you had to get up early in the morning. I did. I, before the sun came up, I would trudge across the field, and all my life was miserable. I'm going to make me milk this cow, the cow that doesn't want to be milked. Um, <laughs> and so part of why I was in college in New York City was because the very first time I got off an airplane and saw New York City, I was like, a land of leisure. <laughs> there is no nature here. It's perfect. <laughs> Going to school because then you didn't have Oh, it was one Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's really fun. And and what you do now is exactly Yes, now I'm growing vegetables right. in the yeah. 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 Right. It's, it's not lost on me. But I mean what And my parents read me about it all the time. That they do. Because what what you really have is this marriage now between what you grew up learning and then what you learned at university yes. and what you... It's a wonderful... I mean, I, I really love this story because it takes the best of both worlds and puts them together. And we'll talk about that very shortly. So, um, well, maybe we should talk about it now. Um, 
what comes out of your work in ecology and in sustainability, which is sort of what's interesting is that one thinks about gardening and one thinks about the environment. But the other aspect when people talk about this is always social justice. Mm -hmm. And it, in a way, you think that's sort of strange, you know, dig the garden. But it's got this whole other um, element to it. So can you talk about why that happens? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I think ultimately the short answer is our questions of sustainability, which I think are the that, that is the environmental question. And what does that mean? Well, um, I, I mean, ask 12 people, you get 12 different answers. But I think, for me, it means something about being in a process in our civilization where we are doing less, where we are not in the process of also undermining the ability of the natural systems to support us. Um, now, that, that's Can you give an example of how we could undermine? Oh, absolutely. So we, I mean, we are at risk, our cities are at risk over the next 50 to 100 years. Uh, I believe the scientists, um, mm -hmm. the, the, I, the numbers don't lie. The, the globe is getting warmer, whether you want to blame anthropocentric causes and, 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 and um, fossil fuel burning, or you want to say, well, this is just a natural process. Either way, it's happening. Nobody denies it's the, the gas. Uh, the cow, it, yeah, it is the cows, actually. Um, a lot of methane. <laughs> um, so our cities are at risk. Um, and, the, and actually, there are countries around the world that are at risk. Um, and they, and the, you, know, you think of Bangladesh, you think of countries in the Pacific. They tend to be countries that are the lowest income at this point. Um, so there is all of a sudden there this, this kind of global environmental issue that when you look at where the impacts are going to fall out, you realize the kinds of hierarchies that we have constructed in our, in our society, also kinds of structures, who's going to get it first um, from the natural feedback. Side. Now, does St. Petersburg, are we at risk? Uh, over the long run, sure. I mean, the, uh, the, the barrier islands, our beaches, are going to roll inward. They're not going to disappear. All the maps that show the, the ocean rising show the barrier islands disappearing, but actually their role is to kind of stand between the mainland. Um, so they will move inland over the next 50 to 100 years. We're going to try to hold them at bay because we've built all these fixed structures on them, but it's going to be difficult. Um, the ocean, the gulf is mighty big and very powerful. Um, so we are looking at a lot of lowland areas that certainly we're either going to have to dike or kind of give up. And what's the time frame of this? Well, that's the golden question. Uh, it depends on whose model you believe. So here's the question that a lot of people will ask. Will it be in my lifetime? <laughs> um, yes, it's happened. I mean, we're already watching it. Um, Superstorm Sandy, I, you know, you look on the map and there are winds in Canada and winds in Miami from the same storm. Mm -hmm. um, largest storm on record. Um, I was up in Boston last week and it's not that unusual to snow on the first day of spring in that it happens every decade or so. But this is after an incredibly snowy winter, and people say, well, global warming, why is it snowing? Well, the, the right term for it is global weirding. Um, <laughs> our weather systems are doing incredibly unusual things, unpredictable things, um, but they're being generated by extra heat in the ocean. So extra snowstorms in the wintertime is going to be a result of it. The Arctic and the, the sort of bands of weather that exist on the climate kind of breaking down in some unusual way. So it being really cold for the last few days is not, um, it, it is part of the kind of predictive set of events that come from. So we're, as far as what people have been saying since the 70s, all the evidence is out there. There really is any challenge to the science. The, the, the obstacle that we have is an obstacle of values and meaning. It's an obstacle of um, deciding not to have an, a truth argument about climate change and deciding to be responsible adults and kind of put a policy forward that anticipates what are best. So social is. justice comes from Social right justice in. is a huge part of that. Okay, so maybe I should step back and because I'm throwing that term around. What exactly does social justice mean? Well, for me, I, mean, I guess I'll take it from my own perspective, I believe that I live in a democratic country that is a meritocracy. And a meritocracy says that when people can make the most of this country, but everybody, every child, 
ought to have a fair opportunity to being able to be in that game, being able to play, being able to participate in those systems. And so justice for me is making sure that those sort of baseline, that baseline equality, access, um, ability to become those people are there. And I think that's the great thing about this country is that we do that better than a lot of places do. But, but finding the places where we don't and trying to do better. Okay, so let's look at this map. Oops, wrong button. There we go. Mm -hmm. Sort of a nice segue given what you just said. So do you want to explain what this map is? Uh, this is a map of, and this is done by a project that's tracking um, strictly African American males and their graduation rate. Um, graduation of, rate from high school. From high school, right. Getting, so getting through high school altogether. Um, states that are red, that are dark red, are less than 50%. Um, and then we've got some bullet points, and ten. these are our 10 lowest performing large districts um, for African American males. And, and Pinellas County. Pinellas County is on the national map. <laughs> Pinellas County is on the national map, which was... Um, not something I was made aware of when I interviewed for my job at Eckerd College. Um, I, and I think it's something that we don't actually spend a whole lot of time. We, I mean, we've got a lot of issues and a lot of things to deal with in this town. Um, and, and, you know, just in the seven years that I've been here, I see a lot of promise in terms of, uh, you know, the, the finding our identity in the 21st century. Um, but this is one of the things that's kind of out there lurking. Um, and, and, when you see it in this perspective, um, up there in New York City, in Baltimore, Detroit, in Milwaukee, mm -hmm. it, it, for me, it became impossible to ignore. But my home state in New Jersey is. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Okay, and then we have. Um, do you want to explain what this is? And this is uh, childhood poverty, um, under the age of 18, and again. Um, what we see is a very large number of African American kids and, um, and a pretty significant number of Hispanic kids as well um, who are living below the poverty line. And so when you see those figures, it's actually, for me as an educator, not a surprise that we see that other map. Those two things are related. Um, and it's, it's been the case we've known it as educators forever that, that poverty and graduation rates that they're part of the same mix and part of the same problem. So we're looking at this because it's relevant to what your thinking was when you developed um, that yeah, piece of cash budget. So could you talk about um, how those statistics helped or influenced you in moving to this? Sure. Um, the well, let me, let me tell a little story. Back in 2006, uh, when I arrived here um, and began to, to sort of prepare myself for my classes at Eckerd College, um, I had a daughter who was five years old and ready to go into kindergarten. And, um, and is she here? She's here. Maxine, could you raise your hand all the way? You want to stand up so we can... Uh... Embarrass you? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so this is... Uh, and did you have another child? I have, I've got a son who was three, so he was going to be good. Do you want to stand up? Hello, Noah. Noah. <laughs> and I, had, I came to, to, I took this position um, thinking about how I was in part going to combine environmental and social things. They were, they were, it was important for me. And as a scholar and, you know, sort of having looked at different ways one approaches these challenges, one of the things that I knew just sort of instinctively is that it's challenging to come in from the outside and address the situation. So I um, got, was getting my classes together, July passes, August passes, well August starts, and I'm from New England and school starts in New England after Labor Day, and on August 8th, 2006, I opened up the St. Petersburg Times, now the Tampa Bay Times, and um, it says school started today. I was like, oh, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> Because I knew in 2006 that right. since school, you mean? I mean the public schools. Public schools. I had failed to enroll my daughter in school. School had started. <laughs> but what, what made it worse? You know, New Yorkers. 
What made it challenging, though, was this. Um, I knew that I was in a district where the schools were part of the school choice program. And I knew that the, the spring before, parents who were responsible... Where now? Yeah. I, I lived down on 36 Avenue South. At the time I lived in Kenwood, I was renting a, uh, a house for the first year. Um, failed to enroll. Choice system. School has started. Oh my God. What have I done? Um, and I actually drive down to the school board and, okay, I've got to register my daughter. And, and no lie, the woman looked up at me from the counter with these sort of sad, pathetic eyes. And she said, we got three elementary schools with seats in them. Uh, and uh, I'm going to put you in this one. Um, Are these one of them? Uh, yes, well one of them ended up being Lakewood, another one was Maximo, and the third was Campbell Park. Um, and I'm no dummy. I thought to myself, right, there's a choice system, which schools are going to have seats? One school has started, oh my god, what have I done? So I get in my car and drive over to Lakewood, where we've been assigned, the whole way kicking myself and, um, and really feeling like I had done my poor daughter this horrible disservice. We get there, we get out of the car, and we walk into the office, and um, I had um, and what I would call a moment of whiteness. This was a majority African-American school, and my immediate thought was, oh my God, is my daughter going to be safe here in the school? And, and then I looked around, and I was looking at six, seven, eight, nine-year-old kids, kids, children. And, and, and it really struck me that that was this really unusual question to be asking about kids. Why? And it occurred to me, it was this like aha moment, so I call it a moment of whiteness. I realized that here I am, this liberal guy who really, I'm not a racist, I'm not. And, and I don't believe in those things, and I, and I support the civil rights movement, and I march with it, and I stand for all of this, and oh my god, that's how racism works through me. Fear. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I thought about it, and I went home with my wonderful and lovely and supportive spouse, Marcella, who's also back there. Hi, Marcella. <laughs> and we talked about whether or not we ought to think a little deeper about this. And essentially, we made the decision to leave our daughter in the school. We decided as educators, well, one, that the fear was something that we needed to confront because it wasn't real, these were kids. Um, that if there ever became a problem, we knew how to address it because we were pretty functional parents. As educators, if there was some absence of education, we could make up for it. We'd be able to identify it right away. Um, and so decided that that was kind of going to be the way that I would begin to invest myself in this community. Because the other thing I realized was this is, that, this is what all of my peers would think. And people like me leave these schools and we run off to the fundamentals. And so there's a million people like me in the fundamentals. And there's nobody like me in these schools. Um, and so let me leave my social capital here and let me see what happens. And then I spent just two or three years um, being on the PTA and being on the school advisory committee and just being there, just being a part of it. And I get odd looks a lot. Um, I, you know, I come in dressed like this and looking like I do. I'm, I'm a pretty white guy. Um, and, What's this guy? What's this guy? But I became a part of the community. And that ultimately gave me an opportunity to then say, well, how can I take my best skills and, and what I what would bring to a fundamental school and bring it to this school. And this other interesting thing happened. I, and again, I, I, I'm still, I can't believe I'm farming. My mom makes fun of me that I'm farming because she knows how much I hate doing this. Um, but I happen to mention... I really love it. Though. I actually know. But I love that people do love it and that I can facilitate their love. That's right. <laughs> I had mentioned in an environmental history class that I was teaching that I'd grown up on a sustainable farm. And the next day, there were like six Eckerd students in their bare feet banging on my door. <laughs> teach us how to grow, teach us how to grow. And so I suddenly had students It's the renaissance of the hippie movement. It is, you're back. Yeah. It's unbelievable. It's We've never been gone. Well, there was a skip generation. There was something that happened in between there. The all those hair bands. Anyway. Um, and so I had. There, I was in the school, 
and the students were pushing me, and we created this project um, in the for winter term of 2009. I took 25 students, and we um, are any of those students here? I don't think any of the original. I believe it's the only one still here. I do have some students. Any students have been in the garden? Worked in the garden? Come over. There's a few of them. Hey. There we go. Great. There we go. All over the place. Um, as well, I mean, I put uh, hundreds at this point. So in 2009, it was just sort of, well, let's let's build this garden. Let's see what happens with it. This is the the Lakewood Edible Peace Patch Garden, increasingly crowded in by the portables because the school has become a place where one of the other things about being in an at risk school is you get to bear witness to how the school system um, operates. Um, and it does, it's not equitable, I'll be honest about that. Yeah, it's been very interesting to learn that from the inside. But we um, we built this, do we, do we have the construction? Yeah, these are just Okay, good. so these are, we, we started with one, we started with... So this is Lakewood. This is Lakewood. And what's this one? This is Sanderling. Uh, Center Lagby World School. This is it's very new, so it doesn't have it hasn't really grown yet. This is Maximo Elementary, and then this is Henry Park Elementary. So yeah, here are my students out in New York digging it up at Lakewood in January 2009. Um, I basically told them, I, I mean, this is how much I resisted it. I said to this group of undergraduates who bothered me for weeks, if you come up with a budget and you come up with a plan and you can design the thing and you come up with a plan then I'll surely do it. And I walked away going, no way. And a week later, they've got a design and they've got a budget. And they're like, okay, Curtis, let's go. Um, and so I, you know, they essentially dragged me kicking and screaming back into uh, farming and agriculture. We did not know what we were really getting ourselves into. We worked during the January term with a bunch of kids from the Fifth grade EBD, which is emotional and behavioral disability, basically it's like I was as an elementary. You can't sit in your seat, and so they had a group of about a dozen of these kids who, and that was actually how we convinced them to let us do it. And these are the taller kids to the left here, um, and then so our students were mentors. Who are these little kids? And the little kids are kindergartners. Some kindergartners who come out. This is just after we finished the garden, and our fifth graders became mentors for them. We have, and these are my two favorite vignettes out of the fifth graders. We had two kids, and all of these kids are kids whose statistics tell you are not going to make it to middle school. They're EBD kids who are already being marginalized in elementary school. They're not going to make it. Um, John Grant, the kid there in front, I ran into a little, guy? that guy, I ran into him a little over a year ago. He's a sophomore at St. Pete High. He has stayed in school. He remembers the garden. He remembered me. He remembered the whole project. More importantly, and I'm now, the name is escaping me, but the kid, other kid in front here, I was at the county awards ceremony because my daughter won the science awards for fifth grade last year in June, and one of the kids who went through our program was winning an award for robotics from Azalea. Um, now, we don't have statistics to connect to A to B, but I like to think that we had a little part in, in that sort of ambition. We then proceeded to just sort of offer sort of environmental education, work with it, whatever classes came up for the semester. There it is just as we constructed it. Um, we did not tie down that greenhouse and it flew away. <laughs> it's long gone. Um, and we decided at the end of the semester to kind of, let's celebrate this somehow. And said, well, let's have a harvest festival. Let's see what happens. There's one of my students, Christina Pucci, working with a group of kids. And um, she's yeah, one of She's students. an Eckerd student, um, an Eckerd graduate. And how old are these um, young people? Those look like third graders <coughs> to me, um, roughly. And we, so we work basically K through third because then you start getting into the testing, and the schools are a little bit worried about keeping them away. Other longer story. Um, and they planted everything, intended it? Planned the garden, planted the garden, tended the garden. As it turned out, um, you know, what you learn when you grow up on a sustainable farm is how to grow stuff, and it becomes instinctive. And I didn't realize how little people knew about growing. So 150 people show up for our first harvest festival, mm -hmm. and they were parents. And they were there because their kids came home and raved about the garden. And what we learned is that that's how you get parents involved in schools, is the kids come in excited about what's happening. Um, and so we realized at that point we were on to something. The fourth grade class, um, one of the fourth grade classes, we had a naming contest. They came up with the name, the Edible Peace Match Garden. 
Oh, the, um, kids, the kids. Yeah, Miss Ash's yeah. class in the fourth grade. We had the pieces really wonderful. It was amazing. Well, on our website, there's a video where the, where you have an interview with John Grant, and and it's very poignant. He, and who's John Grant? He's the kid who's in oh. St. Pete High. Okay. Um, who talked about this project? We never we didn't give them any prompting. We talked about this project as something akin to what Martin Luther King did, and that it was good for blacks and whites, and it was great for community. We were like. <laughs> and it just, it just sort of came out of him in reflection about the project. So, I, I, kicking and screaming, I realized I was onto something that was a little bit bigger than me. Um, and I proceeded to continue to offer it for the next year and the following year. Offering that one of the wonderful things about Echo College is there's a very strong service learning component for all sorts of things, um, which, from a very pragmatic nonprofit perspective, means free labor. Um, and, uh, and it's always good. Always important. Now, I make it educational and meaningful and really try to enhance it, but um, in, in reality. Well, do the schools pay for this? How does no. this happen? Well, this is entirely grant run. So, the first time around, uh, an African American sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha, gave us a very nice grant for our plants and getting in our seed beds, et cetera. Eckerd College um, Environmental Studies provided funding for the initial build out. And then we just started uh, raising money. We went a couple of years just doing the garden. It was only in the third year that I got convinced that this was bigger than just a single garden and started moving towards creating a larger project with a vision for what I call food system intervention in the south side um, came out of this. And so we've been raising money really over the last year quite aggressively. We, the, the Ray's Community Foundation supported our garden at Campbell Park, the, the JCs. Um, uh, Cardio is a salt company, um, has supported us. And it's been just sort of regular development work. And we're actually just in the final stages of a, a community barnery <laughs> campaign uh, where we've been essentially to show some national foundations that we have community support, asking for small donations from the community. So we've been amazingly successful in keeping ourselves uh, funded as we grow. Although we, we are at an interesting turn. So talk again about eating the food. I mean, that's the whole point of growing it, right? That well, well eat one, it. Of the, one of the things we want to do is familiarize kids with with vegetables and food. And you know, these kids all live in a food desert. Um, a food desert is a USDA designation um, that says that there's not a supermarket within a mile. And we'll see maps. Yeah, that. I'll get some maps of that. Okay. But it also it, it's a function of economics, it's a function of poverty, um, and it's a function of what kinds of choices are there and what kinds of skills are available. Right? So You've got kids, and I see them, they live on my street, I live, I live down on the south side, who come home from school and they go out to the Quickie Mart with the five bucks that their mom left them because their mom's working, and they buy Doritos and, and a Coke because that's what they're used to doing. And it's easy. It's easy, but there's also a skill deficit there. They, don't, they wouldn't know how to make themselves a salad. They wouldn't know how to do other things. So we are trying to kind of put that fresh food right in the midst of what they're doing and then give them ownership over it. And there's nothing like owning the stuff that makes the kids want to eat it. Um, the favorite thing at Lakewood now, the kids like to chew on the collards of all things. But they <laughs> well, eat the collards. Yeah. I still yeah. like them. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got kids asking to eat vegetables. Um, and we were we were, a couple of years ago, we were out there when Adam Putnam and the Department of Florida Department of Agriculture took over food services from the school department. And he needed a photo op. And we were the only garden in Pinellas County. And so he came and did a photo op. And I got to talk with him and with school food services people. And said, well, what about serving this in the cafeteria? That was ultimately, I know from my own kids, if they don't eat a healthy diet, they're not studying well, they're not thinking well, it's, you know, mind, body, food, it all works together. Um, so how do we get this in the cafeteria? And I thought there was an objection by food services to do this, and we all said, no, we would love to serve healthy food. We, we, know, we know healthy food, we know what's important. The challenge is we're limited on how much we can pay per dish, and the kids have to choose it. They have to choose it. And they complain about, well, we put food out there all the time, it's healthy, but the kids are like, I don't want that. I don't want to eat the healthy stuff. And we know we have something here where the kids are choosing the food. They want to eat this stuff because they're grown it. And this was the kind of aha that led to the larger vision for the Edible Peace Maps Project, which is that 
in each one of the schools where we will ultimately have gardens, we also want to be serving edible peace plants food in the cafeterias, and we believe the kids will choose it. And in order to do that, um, we have plans to build an urban farm on the south side and to, to build a commercial kitchen on the south side. And all of these pieces, like the schoolyard garden, are wed to what is most important for me, which is education. Ultimately, what I'd like to do is make, turn around the drop-out rate um, on the south side of St. Petersburg um, by creating these opportunities that link people to nature and well, place. Well, you mentioned to me that the science um, teachers see something going on. We have, so we have been, this has, well, again, kicking and screaming, this has been an elaborate improvisation that has gotten way out of control. I opened Pandora's box now, and I can't get it closed again. Um, so we haven't had the time to do all of the measures that we'd like to do, um, but we did find out last year that at Sanderlin L um, IB World School, their FCAT science scores went up by a significant and I'm not a social scientist. What's the, what would be significant at a quintile? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it went up by a quintile, um, and and the only thing that changed in that school was we put a garden into their curriculum. Uh, it's not surprising to me that they see that. It's not surprising to me that we we will see better performance in any of these schools because the statistics and data from around the country show that this kind of experiential learning has an impact um, on student learning, student retention, um, and all sorts of things. So let's look at, you mentioned a lot of things. We have images connected with it. So let's just quickly go Google through. Earth. Uh, I knew I arrived when I could find my garden. Uh, so that's, that's the Lakewood garden. It's in by its, by its uh, portables, but still there. And what else do we have? This is um, the Sanderlin yard at about 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning as we're getting ready for our dig in January of 2012. We had, during the middle of the day, about 130 people out there digging. Was it? We like to think one of the things we do is create these meaningful volunteer opportunities. People took full advantage of it, worked very hard, and by the end of the day, I think the next slide shows what we had created. Um, and we essentially installed the garden. Looks, this is where on Google Earth as well. This is the crop circle, as some people like to say. <laughs> it is, in fact, you can't see the other part of it. It's a water molecule. Because um, it's a science school. It's a science, yeah. And it, we were folding it into their science program, so that was part of our idea. This is the before, during, and after at Campbell Park Elementary. And one of the great things about Campbell Park was that the rays uh, Community Foundation supported it. Um, so Brandon Gomez and Alex Cobb, Major League Baseball players, showed up. And here's the interesting phenomenon at Campbell Park. Usually a lot of guys and a lot of families. A lot of 20-something women showed up. <laughs> right and early, too. And ready, ready to go. And did the guy raise, uh, actually dig? Oh, my goodness. They worked for an hour and a half. And they worked very hard. I mean, the raised staff were the... They were responsible for that getting done. They sent out about 25 people who were there all day long and just kicked butt. Um, but Brandon and Alex both dug in, and it was unbelievable. They weren't standing around for a photo op, although they did at the end. Um, they worked for an hour and a half and worked very hard. And were the um, young people really excited that the Rays were there? Very excited. That's why my son showed up in his uh. race. <laughs> I can't get him out to dig each other than the Rays. Well, that's not true. He's been doing that. And then this is um, the Maximo Garden, Maximo Elementary, um, which went in. And this was this was a little crazy for us. This is the first time we tried to do two gardens in one month, but we did two installs um, in January. And so um, we kind of overlapped weekends and got those done. Okay, now this is a really fascinating. How the beds actually get made. The challenge, as anybody who's grown in Pinellas County can tell you, is that we live on sand. This is a beach from one side to the other. There's, it's hard to keep nutrients in the ground. And in fact, for the first couple of years, we would put topsoil in our beds at Lakewood, and we would come back after the summer and it would be filled with sand. Where did our topsoil go? Um, and so we have developed. Because the sand just comes up. We get, well, the sand is very porous, mm -hmm. so those little tiny pieces of topsoil just wash yeah. away, right. and and the sand that's essentially mm -hmm. elevates itself. So what, it, what is that? So what we what we've done is this is, is called. Hugel culture, it's a modified Hugel culture yeah. because if you know German, Hugel culture literally means hill culture. It's a technique in Germany for maintaining water. They make big hills. 
out of logs and mulch and other organic material um, essentially as a water retention device. One of the challenges for us is water because it rains in the summertime, which is not the growing season, and it's pretty much it's rained twice this mm -hmm. growing season, right? So we um, we had to solve water retention and soil problems, and this does both of those. We so you put, line that it's an bed. impermeable layer, and we've created a base. Is it plastic? It's yeah, it's a roofing plastic. It's, it's a little bit expensive. We go for the high end stuff because we want it to last a long time. That holds about 150 or 200 gallons of water down in the bottom of our bed. Into that, we put a whole lot of mulch, which is recycled yeah. from the city um, mulch site, and, and logs, things. which are recycled from the city and mulch site. And why do you put site. logs in? Uh, because logs can act like sponges. They break, they'll break down slowly, they will retain the moisture, and when they release it, it will be a nutrient-rich release. And in fact, we were wondering whether the plants would figure that out at the, after the first growing season. We dug down, and their roots are going down three and a half feet and working their way into the logs. They know where to find hmm. the nutrients. Um, so, and, and we solved the water problem, solved the nutrient problem, none of this stuff drains away, and then well, we build was up. Was this something you learned with your parents, or is no. this? No, because <laughs> in New England, we grew up in a chicken farm. I mean, okay. you drop the seed, we had natural fertilizer all over. Okay. Which is part of why my family was more successful than they should have been getting their farm in college. Um, I have a wonderful uh, agricultural, uh, I remember my board, uh, Emmanuel Lu, some of you may know him, of course, in my who mind. is so inventive and so willing to try anything. And so we were talking about this and he said, let's, let's try it, let's dig it out, let's see what we can do. Um, so this was an experiment at Lakewood that has now become our technique because it is so incredibly effective. This is the first time, after a summer of this stuff, breaking down, so fish meal, we also put in shrimp. Um, to deal with nematodes. All material that would otherwise go into the waste stream, we're putting it back into... So here's the logs. There's the logs. And, and, then, you mulch, mulch, and then you put fish. fish. Bones and skins that would otherwise go nice. to the trash. Um, more mulch. More mulch. Lots of water. You soak the whole thing up. You cover it with topsoil. Well, that's actually soil starter, which you'll see on the next slide. We mix up with shrimp. And then we throw topsoil on top of that. And after a summer of cooking, you dig into that, you would swear you were in Ohio. I mean, it is rich, dark soil filled with nutrients. And our plants have never been Now, do here. you have to wait till this all decomposes, or do you plant right no, away? No, well, we plant right away, but you have to wait a season for your garden to look as robust as our mature gardens look. Hmm. So our early gardens at Maxwell and Campbell Park are looking a little sad right now, um, but that's as it should be, everything's, well, it hasn't rained since we installed the garden. And does this all smell? Nope. Not at all. Hmm. How come the dead fish? Well, because you're not rotting it. Smell is rot. Rot mm -hmm. is a different kind of breakdown. We are um, composting it, and so we're using microbes and other things. It's a, it's a very natural process. It's a soil building process. Mm -hmm. So no smell. And that's what they look that's like. That's what they look like when they're done. You wouldn't know they were four feet of uh, material underneath. They do tend to sink um, almost two feet as they mature, and then we just amend them as we go forward. Um, and then it becomes an experience for the kids. And what is the green? That looks yes, like it is collard greens. Little collard greens. Yeah, yes, baby collards. Right. They look like baby collards. Yeah. Yeah. So we put in a lot of greens in our first gardens just because they're pretty robust. Mm -hmm. um, they can handle. Well, and they're yummy too. They, if they grow, or, yeah. <laughs> How could they not grow? Well, the thing you learn when you farm is that it's all chaos out there. You can do the same thing in the same place, and the next year it just doesn't. That's a wonderful thing about farming. And in fact, this I think is why that's it's a such good a metaphor for life. Right. Well, that's why. It, I mean, the soft skills that come out mm -hmm. of having to grow food are more profound than any of the science or any of the reading or any of the. And, all the stuff we do with the kids now is linked to Common Core standards because we don't want to waste their time in the schoolyard, we don't want to waste the school's time. But I know from my own experience that even though I hated growing up on the farm, if I hadn't grown up on the farm, I would not have gotten a PhD, I would not have been right. able to do the other things that I and did. And you wouldn't be able to do this. I definitely wouldn't be able to do this. No, I wouldn't be afraid of this. Um, and that's Campbell Park. And so here's our, yeah, so here's part of it. I want to see, I love this picture. Yeah, this was. That the, the lake with Jordan is a very magical place, and my students often reflect about how you know they're worried about school and they're worried about exams and this and that and the other thing, and they go and spend two hours in Lakewood or one of the gardens, and it just 
they feel refreshed mm -hmm. um, and encouraged. Okay, so. So these are our supermarkets on this, well, these were all of our supermarkets on the south side and including the public um, on our third street. Uh, and so those, so those are two publics. Uh, used to be. Uh, these are sweet bays. Well, one of those, yeah, those two are sweet bays. <laughs> were sweet bays. Those prevent. So the pink areas are food deserts, areas where. These are pink all, areas. All of those, right. All are those they areas is more you, than a mile. They aren't pink to me. Are they? Do they look pink? Yeah, they're shaded. Yeah, I guess I'm, I know the original one. Right. I'm using my memory from that. Those dots keep those areas surrounding those dots from being food deserts, those single dots, because that means access, access to food. Um, I always felt as though the 18th Avenue um, Sweet Bay didn't do the full job of a full service supermarket. Um, I have my sustainable cities class actually go in and evaluate um, some of the, the nutritional and presentational things. So which was this one? Which was that one. So you go into the produce section and there's a big box of cookies for four for a dollar. Um, weird, weird sort of marketing things like that going on. But still, full service supermarket until. Yeah. Um, and so the next two slides, they disappear. So that means that area below ISIS 175 and then to the east of 275 is now pink. Um, it is now a food desert. And the area down in Pinellas Point and below Lake Macquarie is also a food desert. So we were, you know, we're in, and up, these are, these are going to be our schools that we're dealing with down on the south side. We are targeting Title I, and Title I means in our definition in Florida, or in Pinellas County, because it's by district, yeah, they are. that 65% or more of the kids are on free and reduced lunch. That's the evaluation. And so then they become available for Title I money, which is extra money for reading coaches and math coaches and other things. But it's also the indicator of poverty. It's the indicator of the challenges that um, we're trying to address. So it's interesting that they get free breakfast, do they get that as well? Breakfast and lunch. And that it's about food. And the whole project is about food. Well, one of, one of the early ideas for doing food at Lakewood was looking at the lunches they were serving my kids. I mean, it's it's awful what they're serving in the schools. I mean, you know, things in plastic bags, uh, food that doesn't, well, we do a harvest fest at Lakewood every single year, and we can't actually use their kitchen to prepare anything more than its final stages. They don't even have a full kitchen there. When we started the Lakewood Garden, we said, well, put your compostables from your cafeteria in this bucket and after a week, we're looking down in the bottom of the bucket, there's nothing fresh moving through these yeah. cafeterias. Um, Everything's pre-prepared and right. then it's heated up. So, so the kids who are on free and reduced lunch are getting a bad nutrition. I mean, they're, they're reading the standards, right? You need this much vitamin this and this much vitamin that, but they're not getting the whole food and the, the healthy food um, that's really necessary for, the, for, the, uh, for healthy development. So your argument would be that um, if children, let's just say the children, mm -hmm. if they got really healthy fresh vegetables and whole grains and all of that, that they would, their whole being would be better. They'd think better, they'd be healthier, and so on. If they, I think, if they're growing it and they're consuming it, that they're participating in something that connects them in some really vital ways, and that, that Ultimately, we can't say we're going to make everybody succeed, but that we would see a more reasonable success rate um, in, in these schools. Um, because, you know, I look at my own kids. What is it that makes them succeed? They think about the future. They, they have a sense of hope. Um, they, they feel some control and some power over what they're doing. And so what we're trying to do there is create that, that identity, that sense of my future is in my own hands, and so it's important for me to tend to it carefully. And that's mostly what we see. I mean, that's what kind of ends up creating a cycle of poverty is hopelessness. is a sense that there is no future and there is no way to control it. So it's, it's a system thing, which means that we can't predict and we can't say A is going to cause B. But I think what we're trying to do is to create circumstances for a better success rate than we had before. Have you seen at all um, 
these young people going in trying to grow their own gardens. Oh my God, they want to take home. I mean, tell my students can tell you they want to take home the seeds, the plants. Um, they they want to. I mean, they want to grow this stuff, and and it's theirs. I mean, I remember the first semester I went one weekend to Lakewood and was just getting some seeds off of a, a cilantro plant, and I heard this yell from behind me. Hey, hey, and I turn around and they see third graders. What are you doing in my garden? <laughs> this, this is theirs. Um, and so they really do they fully identify with it. And I think that's important. I think I, that is so important. I mean, we always grew up right with school spirit. And I mean, this is the whole essence of school essence spirit. Of yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So this is our this is our geographic target area. This is the south side, although we, we move a little bit beyond this pocket. This is the sort of central focus of our. Um, so area. this is your your dreams. This is our dreams, right? Mm -hmm. So. A little hard time. Yeah, the schools. There we go. Well, so in addition to the schools, the first thing we want to do is get all of the south side schools to have schoolyard there gardens. Um, okay. In order to get the food in the cafeteria, though, we want to develop a south side farm. So we've started looking around at some open spaces, some possible possibilities. We um, One of the places we looked at for quite some time was this big open space behind Enoch Davis and Southside Junior High School. <coughs> this has been, um, uh, Goliath Davis has been in negotiation with the school board for several years now with a set of consultants, and they have just agreed to a contract to put a charter school in And that would be over here. And that would be over there. And so um, I'm now talking with him about, well, is it possible for us to do something in this back lot? He's not sure it is given his contract, but he wants to purchase it. And at that point, um, we'd like to farm those four acres. We'd like to put in an urban farm that would go from behind Enoch Davis. And there's some city lots right there that are abandoned that, that we could negotiate the city um, with the city for, and then the county land. Um, that's in there. That's about four acres. And then that's. And there's this is a second area over right adjacent to Bartlett Park right now. The back side of it is open, and the next is a zoom in. So the back side of it is open, but the this uh, other side of it is filled with the construction vehicles and equipment for the rebuild of the Four Street Bridge. Uh, but there's another open space location uh, where we put in about four acres. Our dream, however, is this opportunity. Um, that is never going to be available to the south side ever again. Um, and if we can figure out how to leverage this, um, what we'd like to do here is put in a 10-acre farm. There are 15 acres of open space on Lake Mongori, 15 acres in the most densely uh, populated county in Florida, and that's saying a lot, right? Um, 15 acres. This is an opportunity um, that we keep telling people really ought not be missed because as long as it's open and stays open, we can still have the promise of, of getting a farm on there. This would be enough land to feed all of the schools on the south side mm -hmm. um, and to put in um, the, the kind of urban farm that would actually, I believe, put St. Petersburg on the, on the map um, as a really innovative urban agriculture center. Um, and so we're, this is the kind of the whole system for the Edible Peace Pass project. So our, our gardens, kind of feed the demand um, for the food that will grow in an urban farm. The urban farm itself will be an educational setting as well. We want to work with the Urban League and we want to work with youth, um, kids who are 18 to 24 who have been through the juvenile system and don't believe they should get a GED and don't believe that they have a future. Um, help them get their GED and also help them kind of impart those soft skills. To I, I call it a bootstrap program. What we want to do is, is create community capital on the south side. I don't want to hand out anything. I want to build the capacity um, for the community to to really move forward into the 21st century on a much better footing. Keep those kids in school, keep them connected to their neighborhood and transform um, the south side. And then the, we want to do a culinary institute, the same kind of idea. Out of this comes entrepreneurism, the sort of soft skills of entrepreneurism. Um, I, I can, I was able to elaborately improvise this because I grew up on a farm. I want to share that um, with, the, with the kids and with the community of the South Side, um, which I think has not received our due attention. It's, um, you know, the whole impetus of our town is, has always been to talk about what shapes the identity 
of a city, a place we live. Why do we call it? What is it about St. Petersburg? And we've seen over actually a couple of years now that you know it's all these different aspects. We've looked at people who have had really strong hands in shaping it. And then you look at a project like this where someone has just come and sort of forced by students to do this thing and it sort of snowballs. But you can see it um, being something that really shapes the city in a, in a different way. I mean, if there were this big garden and the schools you know, were using this food and we have this sense in St. Petersburg that there's these gardens everywhere. I mean, so it's interesting how the things that are unexpected can shape our identity. And it's very much like our lives. You know, all of a sudden something happens that you know that don't expect and all of a sudden you're, you're going a different way and it really shapes who you are. That's, I find this very intriguing. I mean, I find this intriguing, but I find it intriguing how things shape us and shape our, our town um, and how we become communities in very different ways. Um, so um, with that, we do have some time. And um, who has a question for Kim <coughs> or a comment? Yes, um, sir, will you please stand up and say who you are and ask your question? Hi, my name is Kevin Hinkley. Um, Maybe you could stand over here so you don't have your back, but I know. <laughs> I was forming the question. Um, so much of our children's education is abstract to them, mm -hmm. piecemeal. Something like this seems to bring it all together. It seems like it should be part of their school day, mm -hmm. at least a period mm -hmm. of their school day. Is there anything moving in that direction? I think that's part of that hunger, mm -hmm. yep. and that hunger your students are talking about. Um, I think it's a silent revolution. Right. Is happening? Do you see that? And is there anybody standing in your way? Uh, no. I mean, the only thing that's holding us back is is our. I mean, there's myself and, and my partner Joe Esposito. Who are the people uh, are the food no, to the schools? Are nobody is standing in our way. No. This the, the potential for this is not. There's not an obstruction to this. It's merely a matter of shifting some imagination and some funders' imaginations into going right. <laughs> This, this really is the right thing to do. And shifting the community imagination to seeing that as well. Our, one of our short-term goals is to work with the, the University of St. Pete's Education School and the Pinellas County Schools to acquire a three-year environmental education grant from the EPA so that in every one of these schools, we are training the teachers to use the, the garden as a classroom. And that's an obstacle right now. To, the educators are not taught how to do this. They're taught the abstract thing. Um, and so we will offer professional development workshops for several summers in a row so that that capacity becomes within the institution, which means that that's no longer this addendum that the Peace Patch is providing, but it is now sustainably a classroom connected to the curriculum of the school. And the, the, the curriculum directors in the, uh, in the school board um, have expressed a great interest in trying to figure out how that goes. So there's no obstacles there. It's a matter of just sort of finding the funding and then building that capacity. I would love to see 10 years from now every single school in Pinellas County have a school garden like this that is a classroom tied to every single piece of the curriculum because the potential is there. Yeah. Everything fits. And then you get the integrative learning. You get the reading and the math and the science all in the same place. And John Dewey, John Dewey knew this a century ago, right? John Dewey told us, and he was right. Um, I, you know, I've been an educator for 20 years. Nobody learned, none of my students have learned better than when they have that hands-on experience. Kip, what do you think is going to have to happen? Could you stand up and no. say who you are, please? <laughs> what do you think is going to have to happen to make that so, What policy-wise? Because look, the issue is to take that tremendous sense of partnership that we see mm -hmm. between the white kids from Eckerd College right. and these African American kids from the south side of St. Pete and make that embedded in the culture of a larger city. What has to happen to make that so? Uh, I, I really think that continuing to push this project forward, um, that, that, that ultimately is our vision to make that happen. 
Um, and I mean, I you know I hate to be pragmatic about it, but the but funding we we are in a funding push to bring in the capacity to be able to do this and to be able to put those partnerships together and make it happen. Now it could be that it takes on some momentum when we begin to hit obstacles. So far, there's been none. There's nobody who's opposed to this. It's a matter of directing the funding in the direction of, of making it happen. And then being realistic about it. This takes some work. This takes the professional development. It takes really getting that commitment from Eckerd kids, from Eckerd College, uh, from USF St. Pete, from St. Pete College, um, from PTAC. I mean, we're really trying to reach an end from the broad community to make that something that people think about doing as part of their citizenship. Um, I think all the pieces are there. And, you know, honestly, um, I have fought this thing. I've tried to quit three times. This project just keeps dragging me along um, and, and taking more and more time out of my day and out of my professional life. And I've just thrown on my hands. Um, so I'm kind of riding the wave rather than, than forcing anything along here. And at times, I, I have to kind of hold it back. Um, so it's very exciting in that sense. Who else? Yes. Could you stand up and say who you are, please? I'm Lothar Ewer. I have a question. Yes. Would these schoolyard organic gardens in the future require artificial fertilizer? Mm. Um, no. We have so much extra organic. This is Florida. People are throwing away their nitrogen and their phosphorus and their carbon, and it's down there at the waste site for the county. And they are spending, last figure I heard, close to $100,000 a year. The city, close to a million dollars a year to ship this stuff over to Tampa. We will take it. Um, we have got more than we need. Um, and that's just because they're, they're, it's such an energy rich and warm climate um, environment. So if you had that big garden mm -hmm. in the door, you could take all of that. We could take, we could take most of what the county sends away. And we've actually talked to them, well, if we end up doing that, would you trade us us saving you that for giving us some water. Um, they're very interested in, in mm -hmm. thinking about those kinds of relationships. Who else said, yes, could you stand up and say your name? Hi, I'm Kathy Hesta, and I'm part of a community service um, committee of a large corporation. What are the volunteer um, aspects that a corporation might help this project with at the current time? At the current time, we have um, probably three or four work days during the semester. We would like to enter into some relationships uh, with corporate volunteer programs where we have uh, um, folks coming out there for the, for the full semester 12-week program that we offer, um, that mentoring program where you're working with the same kids week after week after week after week. Um, we, again, limited by Joe and my time and how much we can do in a given day, haven't been able to pursue that um, with anybody in specific, but that's in our vision and in our goal is to create that. For the time being, what we do is we have a list of volunteers, we have volunteer contacts, so um, you know, send that to me. And whenever we have a work day, we send it out and let everybody know that this Saturday from, from 11 until 4, we're going to be at X and X, X spot, show up, and, and there'll be work to do. Yes, who else has a question? Yes, could you stand up and say your name, please? Hi, my name's Lorraine Michael, and I'm uh, I'm associated with the 74th Street Elementary School. Mm -hmm. It's not in your South Side District. No, I've been, to, I've been there a couple but times. But the grounds there are just abominable, and I'm interested in getting a project like this started in the school. What do I do next? I spoke with the principal, and she said, go. Right. I am, I, and, and I, I do this more often um, than not these days. I'm happy to sit down with uh, a group of people at the school, talk about what costs are, I can give you the budget, I email me. And, okay. and I can, we are not, um, we're not How in this, email you? Uh, kip at peacepatch.org. K-I-P. K-I-P at peacepatch.org. We are not organizationally in a position to, and we're, what we're trying to do is be smart. If, if we answered every single one of these calls and we would be spread all over the county and down in, in Manatee County and, uh, I mean, we would be everywhere at this point because we get these requests all the time. So we're trying to build our core as strongly as we can. However, we are more than happy to share all of our expertise. We're more than happy to have all the volunteers and to let you know what it is that you need and what you're getting yourself into. Um, principals like to know that. 
Because that's the thing with a garden. I mean, it needs tending. Well, yeah, and this is, you know, this local gardening movement, um, having grown up in the 70s under very romantic parents' conditions and learning that, in fact, it's hard, awful, smelly work, um, I, I am always kind of cautioning people, well, it's nice to have the romantic drive, to want to have a garden, but remember, installing a garden is exciting, and harvesting a garden is exciting, and the 90 days in between are deadly boring. <laughs> you have to find other things to do to keep that interesting. Mm -hmm. That's part of what our program mm -hmm. is about. It's very much like making art. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at my art partner there. It's very exciting when you conceive it. Right. It's great when, you know, it's in the gallery right. or the museum, but it's work. hard work it's in work. between. Yeah. Who else has a question? Um, yes. And young man. My name is Joseph Young, um, Hi, Joseph. Professor Chris. Uh, question about, you Tari said African American males are are not made in the school system. Yes. But then, the, and not say the garden isn't a beautiful idea, I'm not connecting the African American males to the garden, the uniqueness of that. Is it, is that? The, the, garden, the gardening and the experiential education was an opportunity that emerged for me to address the problem. So they, they are in fact, and this was the challenge when I got here, what does social justice have to do with environmental sustainability? Um, so in many ways they were problems that would be conceptually different that you might not have put together, but in fact when you start to put them together, what you see is the experiences of the garden create the kind of identity that address some of the issues about thinking about the future in education that is most rampant in this population. Similarly, the nutrition and health that comes out of the garden is addressing the issue of health that is also most rampant in this population and part of the problem. So there's a symbiosis that ultimately emerges out of it. Um, but this is really kind of trying to put that, the, the, the social questions that are haunting us, I think, in many ways, and the ecological questions that are also haunting us into the same problem set. Because ultimately, I think if we don't solve them together and in harmony, we're not going to get the outcome that we want. I think also, maybe one of the things he's asking is, is it essentially connected with young black males? And the answer is no. But it happens to be the case that on the south side, where these gardens are, are focused, there's a large population of young black males, so that they become, in this environment, the ones that participate, as girls do as well. And, and I'm sure that Kip would definitely say that if they were young white males, you'd get the same sort of result. It right. just happens in this population. This is, this well, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to that you on this, and, and the beginning of the talk is about what kind of community are we, and how does one ask questions about what kind of community we are. And so you look at a map that puts our African-American male dropout rate on the national map, and I go, if I want to deal with justice in this community, it is a pretty important issue that needs to be addressed. So that's, that there was someone not that, essential. Yes, could you stand up and say yes, name? Hi, my name is Sue Fraser, and I think everybody should be doing this in their yard. And I'm interested in how you came up with the culture technique, and if you tried other things that didn't work, particularly the shrimp shells, and if you worked for the no, I mean, we went from using, from purchasing topsoil um, from a company that would come and deliver it in a dump truck um, to this Google culture technique, and it's worked. Um, and so it was our first try, and we stuck with it. There is a broader movement called permaculture that's going on around the world. There are elements of that that are all about turning your yard into, uh, you know, into a food lot. Um, there are elements of it that don't quite understand how much nutrients need to come back into the soil after a harvest. Now, it's a wide range of thinking, but it's a very promising movement in that it is saying to us we need to be connected to our food systems and think about our food system. So it was an experiment that worked, and I'm glad we don't have to experiment with it again. We borrowed it from German uh, permaculturalists who were trying to address the problem of water retention or water conservation. So, um, the museum is going to close in five minutes. So, <laughs> so um, I invite you back next month.
the last Thursday, April 25th, and my um, guest is going to be Rick Baker, the former mayor of um, St. Petersburg, so that should be an interesting conversation. Um, and so with that, let's please thank...